A key component of the modern world economy, the chemical industry delivers products and innovations to enhance everyday life. It is also an industry in transformation, where chemical executives and workers are delivering growth and industry-changing advancements while responding to pressures from investors, regulators, and public opinion. Discover how leading companies are approaching these challenges here on The Chemical Show. Join Victoria Meyer, president of Progressio Global and host of The Chemical Show, as she speaks with executives across the industry and learns how they are leading their companies to grow, transform, and push industry boundaries on all frontiers. Here's your host, Victoria Meyer. Hi, this is Victoria Meyer. Welcome to The Chemical Show. This week, I am speaking with Trey Hamblett who is the Vice President of Research in the Chemicals, Petroleum, Refining, and Alternative Fuels Industries of Industrial Info Resources. In this position, he manages research teams that identify and track project spending in all segments of these industries globally. Um, he actually is coming on today to give us some insights about capital spending, economic outlook, et cetera. Trey also did this for us last year. So he was previously on episode 33 of The Chemical Show. So if you'd like to listen to what he had to say last year, um, go back and listen to episode 33. Anyway, we're looking forward to a great conversation. Trey, welcome to The Chemical Show. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to have you here. So tell us a little bit first about IIR um, for those that might not know. Sure. Um, you know, we're approaching our 40th anniversary uh, global headquarters here in, in Texas and have research operations around the world. Um, we're, we're known uh, most for providing uh, market intelligence on the industrial space, everything from power generation through chemical refining, oil and gas, all the traditional industrial markets. And um, I think as of probably this week, we're, we're currently tracking about 270 some odd thousand, about 270,000 plus individual capital projects wow. around the world and maintenance projects at those various industries. And, um, you know, when you, when you track hundreds of thousands of projects in very, very granular detail, every last one of those has been verified with a phone call, person to person confirmation. Um, you can extrapolate from that some very, very powerful statistics. So yeah. uh, you know, analytics in the industrial space, spending in the industrial space, um, those are the things we're known for. Awesome. Yeah. And you guys do a lot of great work and it is interesting, like um, just trying to figure out the, what the truth is, right? Cause there's always a lot of rumors in, um, in the investment world and capital spending world maintenance, what have you. So uh, I think your ability to get in and get real answers is critical. Well, on that point, you know, the, the last uh, credit to IR is, you know, the, the world has become a very large digital place, right? Very, very large digital complex uh, world. And um, we've kept up with those complexities of the di digital world and that, you know, we monitor uh, tens of thousands, millions, really uh, URLs around the world from trade journals and other things. But we still do the very old school traditional means of uh, when we hear something, we see something, we have one of our hundreds of researchers around the world that pick up the phone and uh, communicate with an individual to determine what's the reality of this investment, what's the reality of this project or this capacity addition, and what's yeah. the real timetable and the technology that might be used and the capacity to be generated, et cetera. So we're, we're uh, mixing, if you will, you know, technology and old school telephone calls. Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, I think that's almost the uh, the how to digitize uh, and be successful in balancing digital and human is probably a whole nother topic we could discuss at some sure. point in time. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so here we are, uh, as we're recording this, we're at the end of 2022. This is getting published at the beginning of 23. From an economic outlook perspective, um, if you look at what IIR was projecting, what was the biggest surprise of 2022 versus where the year started? So for me, when, when I started thinking about this question a couple of days ago, I guess in reality, um, one of the biggest surprises has been how quickly the market has embraced some of the ESG initiatives. 
um, how quickly some of that has progressed. We we knew, you know, over the last couple of years, um, when we started getting, you know, the pandemic out of every sentence and every conversation that ESG was one of those next, um, you know, subjects, it was going to be a re regular topic. I just didn't expect it to mature as quite as quickly as it had. We've got uh, roughly $20 billion worth of ESG initiatives in just the chemical space on the near term horizon that have a, a quite quite the potential. And we'll talk a bit more about that maybe later uh, yeah. in our conversation. But the, the other is, you know, when I, um, I look at some of the spend for 2022, we actually uh, did end up achieving a slight increase over 2021, despite inflation, uh, yeah. despite the continued supply chain constraints. So uh, while we didn't, you know, go knock it out of the park and round all the bases at record speed, we, we did have a, a fairly uh, successful year uh, in overall spend for CapEx um, and maintenance in, in 2022. So those were surprises, you know, a little more than what we expected with the challenges we had and uh, a lot more on the ESG uh, movement progressing. Yeah, I think that's interesting. In fact, your, your mention about the supply chain issues um, and how that affects things. On the surface, you would say, you know, prices were strong, demand was strong, of course, people would be investing. And yet, if you can't get the equipment um, and the physical things that you need to actually build that plant, make that investment, what have you, it's, uh, it's hard to progress it along as quickly as you'd like. So um, I think that's just good news for the industry that we're able to see some of that growth. Yeah. So agree. let's turn to, let's turn to 2023. Um, what's your outlook on 2023 and how does that affect the chemical industry? What are you, what are you guys predicting and expecting? Yeah. So, you know, um, 2023 really and beyond uh, the chemical industry is very consumer concentric right and so growth and demand for the chemical industry is very dependent on um, consumer consumption and, and global growth and global markets so when you when you look at um, predictions on population growth and demand growth on a global uh, global level um, you know we, we do anticipate that we'll, we'll continue to see investments uh, geared towards long-term uh, demand. So um, probably, you know, the uh, advancement, as I mentioned, of the ESG initiatives, when I mentioned the 20 billion, we've got nearly a billion dollars in plastic recycling, the, the circular recycling of plastics plan to begin construction in 2023, which is quite significant. Um, you know, only a couple of years ago, those projects were very, very small in, in nature, but now you've got Exxon and Eastman and um, the big companies producing, yeah. are planning hundreds of millions of dollars in um, uh, post-consumer plastic recycling. And that, right. that has the potential for being a, a big spend next year. Carbon capture, um, you know, again, some of those same names, Exxon, uh, Dow, um, and others with air products, you know, planning uh, carbon capture as either um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in existing plants or uh, constructing new units, some of these blue and green commodities. So uh, the ESG initiatives in 2023 are going to be very significant. The, the downside that is that these, um, these ESG projects take a little longer to develop. So we're, we're hoping we'll see some of those plans actually, you know, uh, stay true to the calendar of 2023. But, you know, yeah. in reality, these projects are complex, still somewhat new in, in, uh, in the industrial space in many cases. So, um, and, and I guess lastly, um, you know, mega projects. We're not going to go back to the period that we saw from 2013 through, say, 2018, 2019, where we had six or seven ethylene crackers all under construction simultaneously, uh, where we had, you know, tens of billions uh, being spent uh, in, in one tandem, you know, in tandem and on in the same year. However, you know, we, um, we will see the construction, you know, progress quickly with uh, Chevron's project and OCI's project for a, a blue ammonia project. Uh, Enterprise Products is planning an ethylene unit. So there will be some, some world scale capacity and petrochem built 
uh, but you know, it'd be in the case of one or two units a year instead of you know multiple, like we've seen mm. during the big NGL revolution. Yeah, I think that was an interesting time, right? The whole 2011 to 2013, 14, when everyone announced a mega project, mm -hmm. um, most of which have actually come to fruition. Um, some of it probably not, but but um, I think it's, yeah. I th so there's a tempering a little bit of some of those mega projects. Indeed. Yeah. How about in the... Um, the small to mid-sized companies. I know you reference, you know, these 20 billion in ESG motivated projects and they're big names. They're big names, big companies, big projects. Do you see similar activity um, at mid-sized companies or smaller companies focusing in on ESG? Um, specific to ESG, uh not in the in the same quantities. I mean, uh, in in reality, these these projects are very very costly, and it's a gain for those that can capitalize on it with uh, building block commodities: hydrogen, ammonia, ethylene. You know, the, the building block commodities that you know have scale, and um, and so it's it's certain. You know, there are uh, ESG initiatives down to the smallest producers where they're you know, converting um, lighting in the plant to, e to LED for the, you know, the credits that, that might yeah. equate to, but, um, but not to the, so greenhouse gas reductions, if my memory serves me right, of the 19 billion that we have uh, on the, the target for 2023, about half a billion of that was in emission reductions projects, so five hundred million dollars, which is a you know drop in the bucket compared to the the twenty billion, but it's out there. But the projects are very very small. You know, yeah. when you talk about spending in the medium, small to medium sized chemical companies, that's actually where we saw some of the increase in twenty twenty two that I mentioned early on. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen more in plant capital improvements, those projects in the 10, 20, $25 million investment level. Um, and, and then we saw a high watermark from planned maintenance spending. Uh, we exceeded, and when I say maintenance spending at Industrial Info, we recognize you have day-to-day -day maintenance budgets, but when we talk about the planned turnaround events where a plant's gonna be offline seven days, 10 days, two weeks, yeah. what have you. We report those as individual maintenance events, and when you look at those events specifically, uh, we exceeded three billion dollars here in the U.S. and Canada in the chemical industry in planned maintenance plant turnarounds. Uh, and in the previous year, it was like two and a half billion. So we've seen a, a very uh, sharp increase, a continued increase in in planned maintenance spending, um, yeah. which is encouraging. Yeah, absolutely, and I do think that's interesting. Your your point um, about the smaller, the mid-sized companies focusing on emissions reductions, smaller projects that they can make their own individual impact um, to their numbers, to their effect um, from an ESG and an emissions perspective versus the really big projects with new and novel technology that, yeah, just you need a, a bigger company to steer um, and run those investments. Sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. Um, and I guess this kind of ties into this. I mean, we saw certainly in 2022, several big investment startups, Shell Pennsylvania is one um, example that's been <laughs> the long awaited uh, project that, that has since started up um, several big announcements, right? So CB Chem Qatar um, spending 8.5 billion is, but that's not necessarily the whole story. I mean, so are, are you still, so we had a good investment plan in 2022, a lot of spend. Are you still seeing a strong investment plans going forward with a, kind of across the industry, given what we're facing currently, um, or is it really mixed? Um, well, you know, quickly on the CP Chem project, yes, we're, we're encouraged that's moving forward. And, you know, we've been reporting to our clients since back in the summer that, you know, civil construction was underway and, um, and that project's advancing. But it's, it's an interesting note that uh, they still do not have a permit for that plant, uh, physically do not have uh, the application for the permits around that plant are very, very recent events. So 
um, kind of an interesting backstory there, but we've, we've seen similar, uh, when you look back in the past to some of the other big crackers that were built here in Texas, uh, a number of years ago, four or five years ago, we saw construction start on those while some of their permits are being contested. And I don't think that we're in a period we're going to be contesting permits anymore uh, in, in Texas, I don't think. But, you know, just kind of an interesting backstory there. Um, um, well, and, and do you think part of this, you know, this is speculation, but um, do you think part of that is by making that announcement, it puts a little bit more pressure to get that permit approved? Because, I mean, permitting is a heavy duty process and a critical one, obviously. It is uh, quite the process, but, you know, we're again, we're in uh, the state of Texas where we're pretty uh, aggressive on, you know, investments and things that equal jobs and, and doing it with, you know, the most modern technologies uh, and friendly technologies certainly make it uh, an, an easier pass. But, uh, but sure, you know, there's a race out there as there is for any commodity who can get there first and you, you want to be not only announced you're going to be first, you want to, you know, put your shovel in the ground first. So, um, but I, I think the question was, you know, what's the uh, level of investment activity outside of that? So, you know, because in tandem with that, you have OCI, who's got a, you know, billion dollar plus blue methanol project. And there are several projects out there right now that are, you know, in the billion dollar plus when you, when you get outside of those, there has certainly been some hesitation around, you know, when will the recession that seems a parent is looming on the horizon when will we formally enter that how deep does it go how long does that last do yeah. we end up in a um, um, uh, stagflation environment etc and, and as i mentioned early on in our conversation the chemical industry is very consumer concentric so the the impacts of when how long how deep the uh, the uh, recession makes it and when inflation gets under control will will continue to influence decisions, I think, you know, through 2023 at the least. Yeah. What are you seeing? I mean, I, I think, how does this look geographically around the world, right? So I think we know that North America is in a really solid position and, and we're seeing a lot of investment here. Europe has been significantly impacted by energy prices, the Russia-Ukraine war and other things. Asia and China in particular has been um, impacted significantly by COVID policies. How does that, what are you seeing in terms of the balance of where these investments are taking place and are there geographical shifts? Are, are people investing in other regions to the same level that they used to? Yeah, uh, and, and is your region, um, you mentioned several world regions. I don't, I don't know if this question is really about the world or U.S. in our backyard here, but, um, you know, domestically, very little will change here in, in the U.S. and Canada as it relates to where we will get the big building block commodities. Uh, it's Western Canada and it's Gulf Coast. And I say Western Canada because you have the Dow Net Zero project. Obviously, OCI, Chevron, some of those we already mentioned, additional investments by Air Products, Exxon, et cetera, that are, you know, uh, world scale capacities are all here in Texas and Louisiana. It is interesting, yeah. though, as I, as I sat and in, in, uh, sifted through some of the data yesterday evening preparing for our discussion today, you know, there's um, this market of, up in the Northeast where we have our traditional uh, specialty chem investments. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I was surprised to see there were like a dozen or so pretty significant investments in Arizona and in the Rockies and such specific to uh, by Solvay and Canto and, and others, hydrogen peroxide, some green commodities. Um, so uh, some of the niche markets or the niche commodities do seem to have a, a little less concentric um, uh, association to the Gulf Coast, which is encouraging that the chemical industries, you know, got a geography spread. Yeah. Why do you think that is? It's interesting because I mean, you, it, you know, location, 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 it's either where the feedstock is and good tax and sure. regulatory regimes. It's where the customers are. What's driving Arizona and Colorado? Uh, it's uh, semiconductor industry and electronic grade chemicals, right? So there's a lot of, of big investments in uh, electronics and, and electronic chemicals are a big part of that process. So it's again, being in the backyard of your, your customer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So it is, so it is driven by, by customer location. 
What yeah. about, um, what are you seeing happening in China from an investment perspective? It's, um, I, I don't hear, it seems quiet because we're, we're just talking about COVID um, mm. and the effects of COVID in China and, and their changing policies, but what do you see happening investment wise? Yeah, so you know we've we've definitely seen um, in in the projects that we're tracking, we've seen you know the China spend um, plateau to come off a little bit in comparison to the previous continued growth rate it might have shown. I mean ourselves, we we have you know a, a significant office in China, and and uh, our employees there are still under the impact of quarantines and. Um, you know, reduced work schedules, et cetera. So that's, it's certainly going to continue to weigh on productivity and investments uh, going forward into 23. It, it seems certain. I, I don't think you just uh, flip that around as quickly as, as uh, everyone would like. All right, Trey. So how do you see the current economic environment, right? So we're seeing high inflation around the globe, high energy prices, how is this affecting the industry and its plans? So, you know, the, the energy prices for the chemical industry really uh, becomes more about a feedstock uh, cost, right? Um, the, the cost of natural gas, the cost of NGLs, um, certainly, you know, energy prices and in, in forms of electricity, you know, are significant. We're one of the larger consumers of power. Uh, but again, when you look at the um, where the majority of the spin comes from in the chemical industry is the building block commodities where we're competing against energy prices in Europe. We're competing against feedstock availability in Europe and Asia, which is challenged. We just talked about China and their challenges. You look at um, the challenges in Europe right now because of the Ukraine conflict and their ability to get uh, natural gas and core products. And you compare all those problems with what we have here at home and it, it you know, it's, it's just a very different conversation. We have access to these things and certainly their, you know, their cost is, is significantly more than what it was a year or more ago. But again, uh, when you compare that to the input cost of, of those that we're competing with on a global market, we, we still have the upside in that. Yeah. And I guess that sets the U.S. up to be the exporter of choice for quite Indeed. a while. Indeed. And, you know, that's why um, you, you still have plans um, by uh, potentially -trans energy transfer partners, enterprise who don't have currently installed ethylene capacity in the U.S. Uh, continuing to look at investments because that's now an export commodity. And of course, we can convert that to polyethylene. And we know the, the world, our society did a almost about face on our opinion of single use plastics in the wake of the pandemic, right? And yeah. so the demand for plastics is, is very, uh, very robust long-term uh, because we want safe, secure solutions, not just uh, the increase in packaging, but you know, safety products as well, so. Right, right. Although I think that's interesting. That's an interesting conundrum because I think uh, now that we're past so the peak pandemic, um, I'm hearing, you know, seeing some of the single use plastic bans coming back in place and, and pressures, which all also again, tie to the investment in recycling and circularity and, and reuse. So I think we're, uh, in an interesting evolution as we go with that. Well, a lot of those producers are working to provide a, a green angle to those. So sustainably sourced feedstocks or uh, some of the plastic recycling I mentioned earlier, when we thought about plastic, plastic recycling a decade ago, it was simply sh washing, shredding, and uh, making fibers or something out of the plastic. Uh, and now they're actually taking that plastic back to a base oil-like material that they can put in as a feedstock into an ethylene plant. And they get a polyethylene that you know has its origin from waste plastics to some degree. So it, it um, you know, allows them to put another label on that package that shows where it came from. And then, you know, if you listen to some of the, the majors, the complexity in which we built some of our plastics um, is, is being um, changed in that we built some of the plastics so complex they can't be reused. And they've come out right. with industry and technology now uh, to where they can make these plastics a little more uh, amicable to being repurposed and, and uh, not so difficult to dispose of. Yeah, so absolutely. Coming. 
Yeah, I think, and as I've talked with, um, with various people and just, you know, just an understanding of, of what's going on in the industry, even things like plastic film packaging bags that you might get with food or other products. Um, it's, it's not a single plastic, right? I mean, they're multi-layer, they're very complex, which makes it also harder to recycle, harder to reuse. So I think there are solutions coming in, in this whole concept of designing sustainability in upfront is becoming a much bigger theme and trend um, across the industry, both the chemical industry and the plastics, but also its customers and the end users. Sure. So, so Trey, what are some things that we should be looking out for as in, in 23 where, you know, when we're publishing this, it's the beginning of the year. Um, we're hoping we made it through the freeze in Texas in a seamless fashion. Uh, we won't now for a couple more weeks. We might have to just add in a quick update at the end here, but what should we be looking for as we look out uh, ahead into 2023? Yeah, it said she mentioned the freeze because as you know, we're, we're sitting here in December getting ready for the, I think they're going to name the storm Elliot, if I heard right. Um, make it when it's I look a good back name at, for a storm. <laughs> yeah. When I look back at, you know, the storm in Uri, um, it impacted um, refining and petrochemical units. There were some of those units that were down for, uh, a couple of months uh, because of, of the storm. So um, we could very much be sitting in January with um, some refineries of petrochem plants offline. It'd be interesting to see. I hope, hoping not. So, but, not uh, you know, the, the, the big theme, I think we, we've touched on them probably during the, the short conversation here. Um, and one of those is, you know, the continued advance in carbon capture and the green and blue commodities. Uh, and when I say blue, I mean, you know, the building block commodities of methanol, ammonia, ethylene uh, built with a carbon capture component to it. I think it's unlikely we're going to see um, very many world scale production units built from this point forward that do not have a carbon capture component to them. Um, and, and the financial community and the consumers alike are both embracing these CCS carbon capture sequestration projects. So uh, I think that's something we'll see continue advance um, prominently in the upcoming year. Uh, we, we touched on the fact that you know we're, we're getting some additional ethylene capacity. I think there's probably some announcements. Uh, by others to join that race uh, in next year, which would help, you know, the three to five year outlook for, for overall spending. Uh, we touched on China, you know, how quickly do they resume? Um, you know, we get a lot of products from China, but they're also a consumer of a lot of our commodities. We ship quite a few of our chemical and petrochemical commodities to uh, China, methanol in particular. And um, so, you know, how fast does, does China, you know, restart their engine, so to speak, will be a, yeah. a big theme. And then uh, on the maintenance front, I'm, I mentioned in there that, you know, we reached a new high water mark and planned maintenance turnaround spending uh, this year. And the stage seems to be set for similar uh, investment level and maintenance in 2023. And that's simply because, you know, we're um, in many cases, the uh, particularly in the refining industry, the, the fleet is smaller. We're running everything longer and harder, and it just makes maintenance even even, even more um, more important in the chemical fleet. And you know, we, despite all the ethylene plant additions um, that we've seen come online, and you mentioned the, the Shell project in the Northeast, and uh, there's the Exxon project down here in South Texas, and that's right. all, and others that have completed those. Despite all those additions. Uh, that industry is running at 90 plus percent utilization levels. And uh, when you run plants that hard, that long, it certainly drives maintenance. So we do anticipate maintenance spend being significant this, this upcoming year. Awesome. Interesting. Great stuff. Well, Trey, thank you so much for taking time and, and sharing these insights and, and the conversation. Appreciate having you on the chemical show. Enjoyed being here. Thanks. Good. And thanks everyone for listening. Keep listening, keep following, make sure you're subscribing so that you get every episode uh, delivered straight to you. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks. We've come to the end of today's podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time with us and want to learn more. Simply visit thechemicalshow.com for additional information and helpful resources. Join us again next time here on The Chemical Show with Victoria Meyer.